Good morning. I'm Joe Fryer. And I'm Savannah Sellers. Right now on Morning News Now, relentless, a seemingly endless wave of record-breaking heat, scorching areas from Portland to Philly, Seattle to Secaucus, now putting a damper on coastal reopening efforts. We'll tell you how people are handling the heat and what's causing this major weather event. Holding on to hope as search and rescue efforts in Surfside enter their seventh day, friends and family of those who may still be trapped under the rubble are anxiously waiting for answers. As the death toll ticks higher to 12, the newly uncovered warning about the building's condition months before its collapse. Running on empty just days before the July 4th holiday weekend, drivers are reporting bagged fuel pumps and even outages at some gas stations across the country, signaling supply concerns. We'll dig deeper into what's behind the untimely bottlenecking. And freezing time as more people delay the decision to have children, we spoke to women who say the pandemic and life on pause was the push they needed to freeze their eggs. And it's going to be a hot one here in New York. Yeah. Again. <laughs> again. <laughs> we, Not walking home again. <laughs> what Seattle is feeling, we're now uh, getting a little we taste of here. We absolutely are. It's certainly hot in the city. And that's where we begin today with those blistering hot temperatures across the country. Millions of people are under heat advisories as we head into another day of potentially record heat. Sweltering weather is blanketing the country from coast to coast as the northwest gets out of one of the most extreme heat waves on record. The Northeast is now dealing with temps in the 90s and triple digits. That includes Philadelphia, where we find Randy Gyllenhaal from our NBC station, WCAU. And Randy, it could feel more like 100 degrees in Philly today. How are people there dealing with the heat? Yeah, hot once again. It's uh, been days like this, as you mentioned, and it's going to be a scorcher today. Feels like temperatures above 100 degrees in the city, and that's creating a bit of a heat island effect in Philadelphia, which has so much asphalt. We're live this morning along Philadelphia's historic Boathouse Row. People walking maybe a little bit slower this morning. And check it out, the Schuylkill River over here. uh, These rowers are going to be sweating a lot harder today because once the sun really comes up, the heat wave is going to reach brutal temperatures. Call it hot town, summer in the city. Philadelphia is scorching. Even SEPTA, our bus system, using some of their buses as cooling centers, welcoming people on board. Uh, We got those Mr. Frosty trucks selling the ice cream. Ice cream sales are surging. But really, the only way you can stay cool in this kind of weather is either going inside into the air conditioning, seeing a lot of people staying home, going to shopping malls and other indoor activities, or finding some water. But that is a bit harder for city kids. Uh, You can't really swim in the river here. And we have had some issues with pools being closed. Those are reopening today for the first time in a while. Yeah, Randy, can you tell us a little more about the pool situation? Obviously, that's a great way to beat the heat, especially if you don't have air conditioning, but not all the city pools were open in Philadelphia. So what was going on there? Yeah, it's been uh, two years since they've been open. Last year, of course, they were all closed due to COVID. That was a hot summer, too. This year, about 70 percent of those pools will reopen. It's great for some of these neighborhoods that don't have somewhere else to cool off. Uh, But the reason that number is lower is because Philadelphia, in addition to places on the Jersey Shore and really all over the country, facing that ongoing lifeguard shortage, they've even raised their salary to more than $15 an hour, but still can't get enough people to bite. So here in Philly and really all around the country, We are seeing staff shortages, lifeguard shortages, making it more hard uh, for people to cool off in the city. All right, Randy, stay as cool as you possibly can. Reporting for our NBC station in Philadelphia. Thanks so much. (laughs) How long is it all going to last? Let's get a check on that extreme weather being felt across the country this morning. When it might end. Hi, Bill. Good morning. Here we are talking about this yet again. Hey, good morning. I know, right? Uh, And yesterday wasn't your normal average heat in the Northeast. It was an exceptionally hot day uh, in Boston, for instance. It hit 99 degrees at Logan Airport. That was the hottest in nine years, so that's pretty significant. It hit 102 at Newark Airport, and it was the warmest day in New York City in about a year. Hartford, it was 99 yesterday. So, yeah, it was exceptionally hot, and this is just the temperature. The humidity made it feel like 100 to about 110. So where are we starting this morning? Well, it didn't cool off that much at all last night. It's still 85 degrees to start the morning in Central Park. Same with Boston. So when you're starting at 85, 
you know we're heading up to probably a heat index around 105 later this afternoon. And here's the deal. 43 million people under heat advisories. We do have the people from Philadelphia. A good chunk of New Jersey just outside of New York City is under excessive heat warnings. That's where we expect it to be a little more dangerous today. And as far as how hot will it get, very similar to yesterday. Many of the big cities will be between 95 and maybe 98 degrees today. The heat index will be up there about 100 to 105 at the peak of the afternoon. But what's different about today, is that we get the thunderstorms later this afternoon, this evening. They'll be welcome in the way that they'll cool the atmosphere off. Everyone will love that. But they could bring severe weather with them. In that little area of darker shaded in the middle of the yellow there, that area from Albany right along the Mass Pike to Boston has a chance of actually significant severe storms, possibly even a few tornadoes later on today. As far as the rest of the country goes, we're still hot in areas of the West. It's just not quite as bad, guys, as it was. 103 in Boise, but Seattle's at 82. And then tomorrow... Kind of a back to normal type weather map, numerous areas dealing with some summer rain, but we don't have that really exceptional heat anywhere in the nation. Hmm. All right. Normal is never sound so nice. Yeah, really <laughs> some relief. Finally. I know, right? <laughs> Thanks, Bill. See you next hour. This morning marks the seventh day since the Surfside condo collapse and dozens of families are clinging to hope and waiting for answers about missing loved ones. City officials now say that 12 people are confirmed dead and 149 are still unaccounted for. President Biden and the First Lady are set to visit Surfside on Thursday. NBC News correspondent Antonia Hilton joins us now from Surfside, Florida. Antonia, good morning. So we know that many of these rescue workers at this site are highly experienced. What are they saying about the challenges they're facing in sifting through the rubble here? What is it like at this specific site? And are they still hopeful they can find survivors? Good morning, Savannah. Look, it is an incredibly challenging and agonizing process here as we stretch toward this seventh day. And they're averaging recently finding about one body a day, as you mentioned, bringing the death toll to 12. But the number of unaccounted for stands still at 149, which has been really overwhelming for both officials, workers and community members here to process. And to put this work in context, you know, yesterday I got to get up closer to the rubble site than I have in past days. And I also got to speak to someone who has worked at the site every single day. And what you see and what you hear is that there has been a pancaking effect with mm -hmm. this building, which means that unlike with other disasters, there aren't these open crevices where workers can easily move through and where bodies or survivors would be able to survive. And that's part of why people think they haven't found survivors now for several days, because the building has essentially each floor collapsed one after another flat on top of each other. And, you know, there's this growing tension here between the desire for optimism, the hope that a miracle is going to happen and another survivor is going to be found, and community members who are saying to these workers and to politicians, please be honest with us. You know, mm. if the reality is that our loved ones are very likely, you know, dead or that we're only going to receive body parts of our loved ones, we want to mm. start moving forward with the grieving process. We want closure. And this is just, you know, so painful to watch play out here, frankly, on the ground. And It'll be interesting to see when President Biden arrives tomorrow how that maybe shifts the tone because he talks so openly about his grief. He is often empathetic mm. when he sits down with families that have lost loved ones. It'll be interesting to see if his presence here shifts some of the tone more toward that grieving process uh, since so much has been focused on rescue recently, Savannah. Oh, it's just so heartbreaking to think about what those families are going through and how many questions that they have. Of course, the big question here is how is it possible that this happened? The Miami Herald is actually reporting that a pool contractor took photos of structural damage two days before the collapse that he seemed to think was alarming. What did he see? What did he tell the Herald? That's right. And that Miami Herald reporting has intensified the conversation, the scrutiny here as family members look toward accountability. How did this happen? And many of them are seeking to hold the leadership of that South Tower, the condo association responsible for what they may or may not have known about the condition of the building in the months and in the hours ahead of this, because those photos were taken about 36 hours before this collapse wow. happened. And what they show is extensive standing water corrosion. And it's in an area that's around the pool deck. And I brought this reporting and these photos to an expert engineer named Troy Morgan, who's at Exponent, and asked him to kind of break down for me the seriousness of what's seen in the Miami Herald's reporting. Mm -hmm. And he basically said that it's an interesting clue about 
damage that we may find out is within other parts of the building, but it's not yet the smoking gun that fully explains why this building came down. It's going to be months before we understand fully what was going on in the South Tower, Savannah. And Antonio, we also heard from the mayor of Surfside saying that they've received $1.9 million through this website, supportsurfside.org. How are county officials working to support these families? What's that money for? What kind of support are they receiving? That's been so heartening to see here in Surfside. There is a complete community mobilization, not just in Surfside, in greater Miami, and actually from really around the country. Mm -hmm. People are giving support to family members and to workers in every way that you can imagine. I mean, food, free food, constantly for everyone who is here grieving or here working around the clock. There are also mental health services, actually quite close to where I am right now. They're going to be doing mental health counseling for veterans connected to this crisis, and there are constant supplies of clothing and and uh, religious counseling for people who need everything from literal financial support to just personal day to day support right now. Savannah. Mm, absolutely. We had somebody on our show yesterday who said, if you pray, now's the time to pray. Antonia, thank you so much. Questions about what brought the structure down have only intensified with each passing day. A letter obtained by NBC News shows that the condo board president warned residents of deteriorating conditions in April of this year. That letter was first reported by USA Today. We want to bring in Wendy Rhodes, the senior politics and economy reporter at USA Today, who has been covering this story. So, Wendy, thanks for being with us. First of all, what more can you tell us about the assessment the condo board made in this letter? Sure. So um, initially, it looks like they were going to make an assessment of about nine million dollars. And then and that was after the, the uh, inspection in 2018. As time passed and uh, the damages to the building continued to get worse and worse over time, as they do. And as, as the board pointed out, were exponential as time passed. Um, just between 2018 and 2021, that assessment went from $9 million to about $15 million. Um, and that was for damages uh, to the roof, uh, to the area under the pool, to the balconies, to the facade, to some of the waterproofing. And the residents were, uh, were supposed to start paying those assessments actually in July. Um, just just days after the building collapsed was when the first assessments were due to start being collected to begin these repairs, which we're going to take a significant amount of time to complete. Now you've also reported that a town building official had a very different assessment back in 2018. What did he say? Yeah. So um, he actually met with the board and told them that the building was was in very good condition and reassured them that everything was OK. Um, and I think that that's been a really big concern to people because the inspection report clearly um, disputes that. Um, and also my understanding is that building official now is a contractor for a nearby city of Doral and has been put on leave. But we haven't been able to actually speak with him yet. Um, but it's certainly concerning that a report could show that much damage, that severe damage, and, and basically say that, that the building was in danger of, of imminent failure in, in several respects and then tell the residents that, yeah, certainly seems to be in contrast with what those reports were saying. Now, Wendy, I know you've also been speaking extensively with city and county officials there. How has this operation been going so far from their perspective? Well, the city and county officials, as well as the state officials, have, have been very, very proud of how they've handled this. Um, they say that it's it's meticulous and slow, but that it's being done correctly and for the safety of any potential survivors that are still underground, as well as the rescue crew. Um, certainly, there's, there's families and uh, friends of loved ones that have complained that it's that it's going too slow and you can imagine the absolute agony that you're in um if you fear that somebody you love is buried under the rubble and that and that rescuers are moving slow but but i do believe that officials are on top of this i do believe that they're doing everything they could do in, in the most safe possible right. and they're also providing emotional and mental support, which I think is really huge, not only to the families, but to the first responders 
you know, the first responders as well as the families are at risk of long-term PTSD from something like this. And even the first responders have access to mental health care between their shifts. So um, there's certain counselors and religious leaders with the families at all times. So they're really making sure that people have the support that they need right now. And then going forward, I think the big question is going to be, why did this happen and how can we prevent it from happening again? So they're going to be looking at changing uh, building laws, changing ordinances, changing codes to ensure that not only this doesn't happen again, but other buildings that are around that are at similar risk are retrofitted immediately. Such an important point about mental health there. This has been a dramatic experience for so many people. Wendy, thank you so much for your reporting. Appreciate it. The Delta variant is gaining ground in the U.S. with cases more than doubling every two weeks. It's also spurring mixed messages about mask wearing that's catching many of the 154 million fully vaccinated Americans off guard. The World Health Organization says vaccinated people should wear masks again. Now, health officials in Los Angeles are echoing that same message, recommending everyone in that city keep their masks on. These new recommendations contradict the CDC guidance that says fully vaccinated people can go mask free in most situations. NBC News health and medical reporter Erica Edwards is here with the latest. Erica, good morning. All right. So what's with the CDC saying this and then the World Health Organization saying something else? I mean, this confusion over masks, we've obviously seen this so many times throughout this virus. But what does this mean? Hey, Savannah, good morning. So right now, there's no indication that the CDC is about to make any changes to its mask guidance, which basically says that fully vaccinated people can safely go without masks even indoors. Now, that was that kind of guidance was praised when the agency released it back in March, especially among critics who were upset with you know what they called vague and confusing messaging mm-hmm. on masking. And last night, Dr. Fauci said, address the mask debate and said that some people may still need to wear masks. As a country, the CDC feels we do not need to make any change in the recommendation now because of the efficacy and effectiveness of the vaccines. Now, to be sure, Lester, there will be some people, they could be elderly or people who have underlying conditions who are vaccinated, if they are in a region in which there's a high level of infection, they may choose on their own opinion, which I think is totally reasonable, and that's fine, to say, I want that extra bit of protection. Savannah, I talked with three doctors last night in states where Delta variant is rapidly um, spreading, all strongly encourage us to keep wearing those masks, even fully vaccinated, Savannah. So Eric, of course, as this Delta variant's taking hold here in the country, people who are vaccinated are wondering, am I safe? Moderna's saying its vaccine holds up well against the Delta variant. We've also heard about a doctor who I think followed up the J&J vaccine with a dose of Pfizer. What's going on here with the mRNA vaccines versus J&J, especially as we talk in the context of the Delta variant? Sure. Well, you know, first of all, with the Moderna had a study out yesterday that was promising news that its vaccine is quite effective, although it was a very small study uh, based on just eight people after they were vaccinated. So it really might not reflect real world efficacy. That said, these vaccines do continue to work very, very well. And a lot of experts are saying that they are still worthy um, and protective, even if the effectiveness comes down slightly because of those variants. Mm -hmm. All right, Erica, thank you so much. As the U.S. investigation into the origins of the coronavirus continues, new reporting by NBC News has found ties between a leading researcher at China's Wuhan lab and military scientists. NBC's senior international correspondent Keir Simmons has more. This week, more than 30 international scientists say China should not be allowed to block a full inquiry into the origins of the coronavirus. We can't just give China a veto over whether or not we investigate the most terrible pandemic in a century. In January, a Trump administration fact sheet accused China of secret military activity at a lab in Wuhan. Former State Department advisor David Asher helped write that fact sheet. I'm very confident that the military was funding a secret program that it did involve coronaviruses. I heard this from several foreign researchers who observed uh, researchers in that lab uh, in the military lab coats. 
A leading researcher at the Wuhan Institute of Virology, Dr. Shi Zheng Li, insists it's only a civilian institution. She was questioned this year by Jamie Metzel, a former national security official. At the beginning of the COVID-19, we heard the rumors that in this, it claimed that in our laboratory, we have some project, blah, blah, with the army, blah, blah, this kind of rumors. But this is not correct. But NBC News has evidence Dr. Xi herself has multiple connections with military officials. She and others collaborated with a military scientist on coronavirus research in spring 2018. And with another military scientist, Zhou Yusen, in December 2019. In fall 2020, an article that scientist authored lists him in a footnote as deceased. NBC has been unable to ascertain the circumstances of his death. The State Department has repeatedly raised concerns over China's compliance with the Biological Weapons Convention. Questions over China's transparency now central to President Biden's coronavirus inquiry. Savannah, Joe? Coming up, an untimely gas shortage is expected to impact 4th of July travelers this weekend. We'll tell you what's behind the latest pain at the pump up next. Thinking about a road trip for the holiday weekend? You may want to check your local gas station before taking off. Several states are reporting gas delivery issues leading to outages and pumps with those yellow out-of-service bags over them. Drivers are also dealing with soaring prices at the pump. NBC News senior business reporter Ben Popkin joins us now for a closer look at this. So, Ben, part of the problem is that gas companies are struggling to hire drivers. What's happening there? Well, petroleum delivery companies are facing a driver shortage. They're offering bonuses of $10,000 to $15,000 as a sign-on bonus. Some are saying you don't even need direct petroleum delivery experience. They'll train you if you previously drove a tractor trailer. So tank truck truck drivers were hit hard during the lockdowns last year when fuel demand and driving just dr fell off. And some of those drivers retired early, they found new work, and that's top on top of an existing long-term hiring problem in the industry has faced with an aging workforce and not enough young workers who want to go into the business. Uh, so an estimated up to 25% of tank trucks are sitting idle due to a lack of qualified drivers. That's up from 10% in 2019. And that's happening at the same time, Lockdown Americans are hitting the road for much needed summer break. Estimated 43.6 million uh, Americans will be hitting the road this holiday, uh, an all new record. That's straining supply and pushing up those prices, hitting a 310 national average. So, Ben, just last month we saw gas shortages when the Colonial Pipeline was hit with a cyber attack. Will these shortages be that bad this time around? And this is not Colonial Pipeline 2.0. That was a supply issue, and this is distinctly a delivery issue and much more isolated. There's going to be a handful of shortages that are being noticed uh, in some of these harder-to-get-to areas. Think smaller gas chains in kind of remote, high-tourist areas, like your beaches and, and your mountains. Most drivers won't notice, and if you do, just drive around down the road. Uh, this will probably be isolated to a, a single chain in, in a, in a, or a store in an area. Uh, there's more gas around the corner. Yeah, I was about to say, I was just going to ask you, is there anything drivers should know that they can do to try and deal with this problem now? And is this something we could be dealing with all summer long? Well, general rule of thumb is truer than ever. You know, drive at off peak times if you can. Use windows instead of AC to cut down on your gas use. And when you notice uh, you got about a quarter tank of gas left, well, that's when you should start looking for the exit sign and, and fill up. No one wants to get stranded in busy holiday traffic with uh, with a family. But, uh, but experts say this could be just the beginning of seeing more fragility in the gas supply chain. We're going into July, which has even higher demand. Yep. I mean, a lot of cars on the road this weekend and throughout the summer. All right, Ben Popkin, thanks so much. Appreciate it. Let's look at what's making news around the world this morning. NBC's Claudio Lavaga joins us now from Rome. Claudio, good morning. 
Morning, Joe. Good morning, Savannah. Well, Canada experienced the highest temperature on record for the third day in a row. Now, Canadians don't seem to know where to turn to cool down these days. It was 120 Fahrenheit yesterday in British Columbia. The authorities say that uh, since the start of the record-breaking heat wave last Friday, well, that was a contributing factor to at least 130 deaths, especially in the Vancouver area. And in other news, well, Kim Jong-un has blamed senior officials of causing what he called was a grave incident that caused a huge crisis in the uh, fight against coronavirus. Now, the uh, state-run news agency in North Korea said that the North Korean leader said that that unspecified incident is not clear. Well, that was led to a threat to public safety. Now, uh, it has been read abroad as an admission by North Korea that it has a problem with coronavirus, especially after it told the WHO that it found zero cases of COVID-19 in their own country. And last night, England beat Germany 2-0 in front of an ecstatic home crowd at London's Wembley Stadium. Among them there were three very special fans, the Duke and Duchess of Cambridge and their son, Prince George. But the excitement by football fans in England was a bit dampened by the knowledge that they will have to observe five-day quarantine if they travel to Rome, where on Saturday England will play the next game, the quarterfinal against Ukraine, meaning they don't have time to travel to Rome and they can't watch the game. So that was a bit of a bummer. Well, the UK government said that they should just stay home and watch it on television. How about that? Yeah, or well, they can travel, sit in a hotel and watch, but that doesn't sound very much fun either. <laughs> then at least they could get out after and take a little trip. Exactly. Not quite the same thing. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Definitely not the same thing. Thanks, Claudio. Coming up, as Pride Month comes to a close, a historic pageant victory. Yeah, we're going to introduce you to the first transgender Miss USA contestant. That's next. One beauty queen will make history as the first openly transgender woman to compete in the Miss USA pageant. 27-year-old Cataluna Enriquez was crowned Miss Nevada USA, beating out 21 other contestants. Her platform centered around transgender awareness and mental health. She'll now travel to Tulsa in November to compete for the title Miss USA. Enriquez took to Instagram to thank the LGBTQ community, saying, my win is our win. We made history. Happy Pride. What a great way to close out our Pride Month coverage right there with that good news. Absolutely. And I love that her platform included mental health. I mean, just so important for that community. It it is incredibly important now more than ever. Yeah, absolutely. Thank you, Joe. Now, though, to a challenge faced by the transgender community as a new law in Arkansas will ban doctors from prescribing hormones to transgender children under 18. Some families are now leaving the state in search of a more accepting home for their kids. NBC News senior national correspondent Kate Snow spoke to one family about their journey. Right up there in the opening. If you want to see George and Emily Spurrier's son light up. I have six favorite birds because I can't choose just one. Just ask him about birds. Crows, blue and gold macaws specifically, roadrunners. The 17-year-old asked us not to use his name. He and his family just moved to New Mexico from Arkansas. Why did you move right now? Our son is transgender, and some of the recent efforts have promised to make our lives and his life very difficult. Did Arkansas feel like an accepting place? It did not feel accepting at all. A sweeping new law is set to take effect in Arkansas in July, banning doctors from prescribing hormones or puberty blockers to transgender children under 18 and stopping insurance companies from covering such treatments. For the Spuriers, it would have meant ending testosterone treatments they call life-changing. Were you concerned that it would impact his mental health? Absolutely. There's no doubt it would have. No. It's not an if, it is it would have happened. Instead, they moved 800 miles west. It was quite a hard decision. You know, it feels like we've been forced out, in a sense. We were forced out by ignorance. Arkansas's law goes furthest, but legislation restricting health care for transgender youth has been introduced in 19 states this year. When you're a young person who has the self-awareness and the strength to know exactly who you are, and then to have people debating you, 
deciding that you don't deserve health care, that is traumatic. That Chase Strangio with the ACLU says many families won't have the means to move. I left both my parents. For Emily, it was hard to leave family behind. My kid comes first. Getting out here gives our son a chance to flourish, not just to exist, but to be the self he wants to be and that he's supposed to be. Their son hopes to help birds this summer. There's a bird sanctuary and it takes volunteers. A new start in a new state. Kate Snow, NBC News. The House voted more than two to one to remove Confederate statues from the Capitol. 67 Republican Congress members voted with Democrats to pass the bill. It now heads to the Senate, where it will need to overcome the 60 vote threshold to take effect. A similar measure passed last year, but stalled in the GOP controlled Senate. Now, today, congressional Democrats are pushing ahead with their probe into the January 6th riot on Capitol Hill. The House is likely to vote and then pass a bill for a select committee to investigate the insurrection. NBC News Capitol Hill correspondent Garrett Haig joins us now from home. Good morning, Garrett. Good to see you. All right. So the House passed the bill, as we just mentioned, to remove those Confederate statues by 285 to 120. But tell us now what happens for them to actually get removed. Hey, Savannah. Well, getting 70-ish Republican votes is a pretty good sign for this bill's chances when it moves over to the Senate. It would be subject to that 60-vote threshold. So Democrats would need to pick up 10 Republicans or so to vote in favor. I think that's possible. We've already seen Amy Klobuchar, who's the chairwoman of the Rules Committee in the Senate, say she looks forward to trying to move this bill through the Senate when I asked Senate Democrats about it earlier in the week. It was kind of not on their radar, but this could come up potentially after the 4th of July recess or later in this year. Uh, and I think the shot is pretty good that this will pass and that those remaining Confederate statues will be removed. Now, Garrett, let's talk about this January 6th committee vote set for today. So some details haven't been worked out, like who's going to be on the committee. What can you tell us about Speaker Pelosi's strategy at this point and what we do now? Well, I expect we're going to see a party line vote when this happens uh, mm -hmm. late this afternoon. We might see a handful, maybe as few as three Republicans cross over and vote in favor of this committee. If any Republicans do, they might be rewarded with a seat on the committee picked by Speaker Pelosi. She has made it clear through an aide that she's at least considering the prospect of put, making a Republican one of her eight picks out of the 13 seats uh, to sit on this committee. Pelosi wants to try to make the work of this committee look as bipartisan as possible, even though it's going to be way more partisan than what would have happened with a commission vote that was voted down in the Senate earlier this year. And by the way, Savannah, it's going to be a really interesting split screen today. A bunch of House Republicans won't even be in town for this vote. They'll be on the Texas-Mexico border with President Trump. I'm so happy you brought that up because that's exactly who I want to talk about next. The former president, he's not only doing that, headed to the border with that group, but he's also wading into the infrastructure debate, slamming Senate Minority Leader Mitch McConnell, as well as Republican senators working on this bipartisan deal. I mean, I think you just kind of answered this question by saying that we've got this whole group heading with him to the border. But let's talk just through how much sway the former president could have over the delicate process of this potential bipartisan infrastructure deal. Well, in the Senate, he's not that much of a player. Of the five Republicans who've been working on this bill with Democrats in the Senate, pretty much all of them have just gotten reelected or are like Lisa Murkowski, who are kind of already in their own private wars with yeah. Trump. So to Mitch McConnell, the minority leader, has been bashed by Trump over and over again. He doesn't seem to mind. So in the Senate, I don't know that Trump's involvement is going to make much of a difference. But if and when that bipartisan deal goes to the House, that's a different story. There you might see Trump hold back Republican House members' support mm -hmm. for the bill and make Democrats carry even what is a bipartisan effort in the Senate entirely on their backs in the House. And that might be tough because there are things in this bill and things left out of it that really uh, make progressives unhappy. So, you know, put a pin in that thought about uh, Trump's involvement till later in the fall, if and when that bipartisan deal makes it over to the House for a vote. All right, Garrett Haik, as always, thank you so much. You bet. Coming up, the pandemic's effect on relationships, dating, and starting a family. Why many women took the steps to freeze their eggs during lockdown. Up next.
While the country is finally opening back up, the pandemic has meant a year of delays for many things for many people, whether it's a wedding, vacation, or starting a family. That's caused a lot of women to take a closer look at their fertility and their plans to have children. We've all experienced a year on pause, which for some meant their love life was on hold as dating became a no-go and plans to have kids were pushed further down the road. It's a lot of pressure for women, I think, to have that timeline. It's like a ticking time bomb. Anna Weissman is one of many women who says that life on lockdown was the push she needed to decide to freeze her eggs. Knowing that this would be a goal of yours to have a family, what has the last year been like to, to have all of that be on hold? I think at first I was sad and mad about it, you know, and then you realize bigger picture, especially during the pandemic. I had my health, my family had their health and prioritizing that as opposed to my dating life while knowing that I had this backup plan in place, I think made it a little more bearable. For Ali Jackson, the pandemic brought about a breakup and put additional pressure on dating. I think that like this happened to a lot of people where the pandemic really, I think, accelerated what probably would have already happened with that relationship. So we broke up in July and then I went into the rest of 2020 single and kind of, you know, was like popped out into the world that, you know, can't talk to anybody, can't meet anybody. And also realizing that when I do meet somebody, I don't want to fast forward because I I want to make sure that we're a good fit and, you know, going to be good long-term partners. She just finished the egg freezing process earlier this month. Another pandemic-related motivation for her? Seeing her friends juggle parenting duties along with working from home. I always knew that I wasn't immediately ready for kids. I wasn't sure if I wanted them in the future, and I really appreciate that at this juncture in my life. As I saw a lot of friends and family members, you know, having kids through the pandemic and, and all of the additional responsibilities and, uh, and, and things that came along with that. I'm currently single. Even if I were to meet a partner tomorrow that I want to get married and have kids with, it would not be right now. The decision to delay having kids has been a trend in recent years, with CDC data showing the U.S. birth rate declining for the sixth straight year to the lowest level since 1979. And this year, some top clinics across the country saw an increase in egg freezing procedures, including NYU Langone with a 41% spike from June to December of 2020 compared to 2019. That's where reproductive endocrinologist and infertility specialist Dr. Brooke Hodes-Wurtz practices. And she says we're in a full-on egg freezing boom. This work from home culture tied in with the increase in telemedicine is really greatly improving the ability for women to get into the clinic, to even people, people that were thinking about it that was kind of on their back burner. They've had time now to sit, prioritize, think about their future, and they can actually fit it in between meetings. Both women say the opportunity to work from home and life on pause did make the process easier. It's one great thing that has come out of an otherwise pretty horrible year for a lot of people. And I was fortunate enough to be able to do this and come out of the pandemic with this insurance and this backup plan that I have a little bit more time to find the perfect person to start a family with. It felt not real. It honestly kind of feels a little bit surreal that like my eggs are off somewhere in a freezer, like hanging out, but it now does. I really feel like there's this lack of pressure in that, in that sense that I didn't know if I would feel, but I definitely do. It's time for some medical news you can use. NBC News senior medical correspondent Dr. John Torres joins us for our weekly checkup discussing the latest health headlines you probably missed. Good morning, Dr. John. It's always great to have you here. So let's start with this one. A new study shows that people with heart failure may be more likely to develop cancer. What types of con cancers were these patients most at risk for, Dr. John, and what should people be on the lookout for? 
And Savannah, this is a very interesting study because you wouldn't think those two would necessarily be connected, but it turns out they possibly are. And what they did in Germany, they looked at 200,000 people. 100,000 had heart failure. They followed all of them for 10 years and then looked to see if they developed cancers. What mm. they found out, those with heart failure were at high, highest risk of getting cancers of the lip, the oral cavity, that's your mouth, the pharynx, the back of your mouth, followed by lung cancer. And as a matter of fact, they were almost twice as likely to develop it versus mm. those who did not have heart failure. Now, they think there might might be a biological basis behind this, and that basis would be that the failing heart actually secretes some factors that could promote tumor growth. So they're saying you want to make sure you get that heart failure under control if you have mm. it. So here are the doctor's orders. First and foremost, if you're at risk for heart failure or think you might be having heart failure, a lot of times swelling of the legs, those types of things, mm. get it checked out to make sure that if you do have it, you get it treated. Because getting it treated can make sure it doesn't secrete those factors and it doesn't produce those types of tumors. And so that's extremely important, Savannah. Yeah, wow. Here's another study. Researchers in Canada have put together an online calculator that can predict the odds of someone being diagnosed with dementia. What more can you tell us about this one, Dr. John? And Joe, they did this, and it doesn't, doesn't tell you you're going to have dementia. It just predicts that you might have it, and it tells you the risk factors you need to look out for. And this was a Canadian study. They looked at 75,000 people. They followed them at age 55 for the next five years after doing this risk calculation, and they found out that it can actually help reduce the risk of the diagnosis over the next five years if they get these things under control. Wow. The biggest things they're talking about, physical activity, alcohol, consumption of, I'm sorry, alcohol consumption, stress, those types of things things, getting them under control can really be helpful. So what are the doctor's orders? Well, first and foremost, you want to look at your different criteria. What kind of things are you doing in your life? Better understand your brain health and how they impact your brain health. And then find ways to modify your lifestyle, particularly if you smoke, stop smoking. If you drink excessive alcohol, stop that. Start exercise programs. Those things we know that can keep our body healthy. Turns out, Joe, they can keep our heart he our, our brain healthy as well. And that's going to be important, especially as we get older and older. Absolutely. I mean, the fact that you said you can even reverse it feels like really big news to have a tool like that. Um, Dr. John, lastly, a Johns Hopkins study shows the most curious babies turned into the most curious toddlers, which, aside from being adorable, is actually something pretty interesting. What does it mean for child development? And, you know, this is a great study, and this is one of my favorite ones, because what they did is they took children, 6- to 11-month-old children, and they showed them magic tricks. And those that <laughs> stared at 6 months of age or up to 11 months of age at the wow. magic trick, and they followed the trick, they went later on, a year, when they were a year and a half old, and found out those same ones were just doing the same thing. They are the ones that are most captivated by the magic tricks versus the other babies. And so the most important thing to do, and with children, it's a wonderful thing. Their curiosity is amazing. But let them run with that curiosity. So the doctor's orders are just let your kids imaginations <laughs> run wild. They will do amazing things. Just give them the tools they can use. So take the structure out of their daily environment, at least some parts of the day, and just give them the tools they can use with. I know with my children, one of the best toys they ever had, believe it or not, was a refrigerator box. The box our refrigerator <laughs> came in, and they must have used that for about two months. <laughs> it was a rocket. It was a Ford. It was a racing car. Anything you can think of, they used it until finally one night I just had to toss it out because it was completely <laughs> falling apart. But their imaginations are amazing. We want to keep that curiosity going. Oh, I, I wonder how that. experienced those magicians were. Were they like really good magicians <laughs> yeah, or just like, like parents like trying to do tricks? <laughs> I love the lesson too because I feel like so many times you do hear stories about people are like, I bought my kids all these fancy toys, but they just want the box. They just want the box. There it's a really good point about imagination. Whatever yeah. it takes. All right, Dr. John, thanks so much. Great studies. Appreciate chalk. it. It's amazing. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you. you we bet. love when we do this segment with you. Thanks. Now it's time for our CNBC Money Minute, the biggest financial headlines of the day and why they matter to you. CNBC's Christina Parts and Evelis joins us now. Hey, Christina, good morning. Good morning. We have Chinese ride-hailing giant Didi making its debut on the New York Stock Exchange today. After pricing its IPO, the company raising more than $4 billion in the deal, giving it a market value of just ah, $67 billion. That trails Uber, but is well ahead of Lyft. Didi is the largest U.S.-listed Chinese IPO since Alibaba back in 2014. Uh, it has m roughly more than 550 million users and provides taxi and private car hailing, bike sharing, and on-demand delivery. 
Southwest Airlines is increasing overtime pay, including offering double time for flight attendants as it tries to head off potential staffing crunches during the 4th of July weekend. Southwest has been hit by technical glitches and bad weather in recent weeks. The Wall Street Journal says Southwest hopes the extra pay will encourage employees to pick up shifts or work additional trips. But pilots say the offer is just a temporary patch and it doesn't address training issues that's led to not enough pilots being available to fly the summer schedule. Americans lost nearly $30 billion to phone scams over the past year. A report from Truecaller, a call ID and spam blocking app, finds more than 59 million people fell victim and about 20% were hit by scams more than once. Not only is the number of scanned consumers rising, but so is the cost. The average reported loss was about $500 per person. Do either of you use the app to block spam calls? Yeah, no, but I, I should. I do, and all they do is just tell me I have spam, but then the phone still rings. So, yeah. have you had any luck with them? No, I, I'm just wondering if it's if it's worth it because I haven't used the app, and I I get calls all the time, and it just annoys the crap out of me. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> they I, can I, they can tell you it's spam, so you do know to. Yeah, mine that. will say spam risk. Yeah. yeah, but oh, mine doesn't. Okay, yeah. good to know. And then it, the thing is, is if it's an area code that I know, it, they're doing that now, or then they trick you even. It's usually more. your area code. Yeah, yeah. and like, then. Yeah. I'm like, is this work? So right. then I answer. And I'm like, and they got me again. <laughs> Thanks, Christina. Thanks. Coming up, a look at the movement for queer acceptance outside of the U.S. Where in nearly 70 countries, homosexuality is a crime with sometimes devastating consequences. That's next. After a month of pride celebrations in the U.S., it can be easy to forget that life for LGBTQ people in some parts of the world is very different. Stay tuned. Reporter Maya Eaglin talked to several LGBTQ activists from around the world about what life is like for them and the rights they're still fighting for. So what is like to be a gay person in Bangladesh? It is like when the legal system acknowledges you as a criminal. As a queer person in Cameroon, you're aware of the laws, you're aware of um, traditionalists saying that um, homosexuality is on Cameroonian and is on African. Sex-sex marriage legalization is not the end of the LGBTQ rights. It's like a starting point. It can be easy to celebrate how far we've come with LGBTQ rights here in the U.S., but it's not the same for a lot of queer people around the world. In 69 countries, it's illegal to have same-sex relations, meaning being out and proud could have devastating consequences. It was very hard for me to choose to leave my country. My mother told me, if I know that you are alive, even though I cannot touch you, feel you, and see you in person, that's enough for me. Anbid Zaman started working as a queer activist in Bangladesh when he was just 16. Homosexuality is illegal there and could get you life in prison. It really felt like we are going to uh, change the world around us and uh, we were very motivated. While working at Bangladesh's first LGBT magazine, he helped put on a yearly rainbow rally to promote queer visibility. But in 2016, everything changed after extremist groups threatened the rally and its organizers. And we had a meeting organized um, together with my two dear colleagues. And I was half an hour late and I received a phone call that there had been an attack. Two of Anbid's friends were murdered. The Bangladeshi branch of Al-Qaeda later claimed responsibility, saying it targeted them for practicing and promoting homosexuality. I found my father standing under, uh, uh, like in front of the building where we were residing. His, his eyes were red and he slapped me and he was like, I don't know how to save you. Anbid went into hiding and fled Bangladesh with the help of several international organizations. Now, 25-year-old Anbid is living in Cologne, Germany, working with a bunch of different LGBTQ organizations. I think um, one of the greatest things about me having to flee Bangladesh is that I see myself as a global citizen. But, you know, one person alone cannot solve problems globally. There are so many wonderful things that we can have only if we all want to have them. Over in Taiwan, LGBTQ activists have seen progress in the fight for equality. 
In 2019, it became the first and only place in Asia to legalize same-sex marriage. But this research fellow says there's still more to fight for. Same-sex couples could not adopt kids, but single person can. And we are still advocating for a better uh, legal protection for trans people. It's very important that we bring more people on board on our side to push for more change. Each time I go out with a girl and have dinner or kiss or I even show up at Pride, part of me feels a bit guilty. Part of me feels like I'm able to do all this, but my brothers and sisters back home can't. Bandy Kiki is an LGBTQ activist from Cameroon, where same-sex relations can be punished for up to five years in prison. At 19, she moved to the UK to study, where she eventually came out publicly. I can't begin to tell you how mentally liberating it is. I used to go to bed thinking, what if somebody finds out I'm a lesbian? and, and uh, goes online. But now I'm just like, <laughs> I really told you. Kiki says she still faces hate online from people in Cameroon, but says living openly is a way she can help. There's a, a very young girl who is also part of the Cameroonian LGBTQ community in Cameroon. And she came to my inbox and said, Kiki, if you break, a lot of us would break. Don't. It was one of the most profound things somebody ever said to me. As simple as it is, but it just made so much sense to me. Hey, NBC News viewers, thanks for checking out our YouTube channel. Subscribe by clicking on that button down here and click on any of the videos over here to watch the latest interviews, show highlights, and digital exclusives. Thanks for watching.